all over Europe, Hungarian, British. The Indian ambassador declined to come because he said, we're a secular country, so we cannot attend this particular event. But also we see in the Western world a very interesting phenomenon. There is overall a decline in Christianity. The churches in Italy are almost empty. The churches in Great Britain are largely being sold to other groups. The younger people in the West, particularly in Europe, are abandoning Christianity and also to a great extent in the United States. However, there is one notable difference, which is the evangelical movement or the American fundamentalist, we call them, and that group is growing. Even though Christianity is overall growing, that group is, is in decline, that group is growing, particularly in the United States. They haven't been accepted in Europe so far. And that is also the main group that is coming to India and their, center of, their central point is Andhra Pradesh. This is what they're doing. And it's interesting to note that they represent an educationally backward part of the American culture. They are opposed, for example, to the teaching of evolution in the schools. So we have an interesting phenomenon. Uh, for example, I have a number of Hindu friends in Houston in the southern United States. And a lot of their employees are fundamentalist Christians. And they were talking to some of the fundamentalist Christians. They would not allow their children to attend certain science classes because of the rejection of evolution and so forth. And so the Hindus said, and that's very good for us because that means in the next generation, you will also be working for our children <laughs> because you're opting out of education. It's interesting to note that the Christianity you find in India is more backwards than the Christianity you find in the United States. What was this uh, book, The Da Vinci Code? It was banned in India, a non-Christian country. There was not a single Christian country where it was banned and it was available at every major theater in the United States and apart from a few grumblings by the Vatican, uh, there was no real major protest or attempts to uh, stop that. We also have seen in South America, which is largely a Catholic country, that now it's gone up to, at least in Brazil, 20% uh, evangelicals. And we talked to them, why did you become evangelical? It says, well, everything's easier. You go to heaven immediately. You don't have to do any sadhana. You don't have to do any work. It's salvation is by belief. And once you've accepted Jesus, you don't even need to go to church anymore. <laughs> you're free and if you commit sins then you just ask for forgiveness again. Some years ago in America uh, when they explained Christianity and salvation from sin to the Native Americans the Native Americans said well uh, doesn't that encourage you to sin more? Because after all you sin God will forgive you you can sin again and God will forgive you again. But this is the group that has been causing the trouble. This is the group that uh, a lot of the Republicans are involved with. But I would also tell you it's a group that will not come to power in the United States, uh, but it will cause some difficulties. And it is a group that is causing trouble uh, in India and is also uh, targeting the poor, as you know. And we've also found that not only in India, but in other countries of the world, because of this evangelical threat, the Catholics have also taken up the conversion cause more strongly and also the countering of the evangelicals and the Hindus. In fact, I would say lack of unity among the Hindus is one of the worst uh, causes. And we have so many Hindu organizations that will not call themselves Hindu, that will not emphasize uh, Sanatana Dharma, and that are more concerned with their own following and rather than uniting the Hindu forces. At the same time, there are a number of groups that are doing something different. One group I've worked with a fair amount is Swami Narayan organization. Uh, they are not so prominent in Hyderabad, but they have built this wonderful Akshardham temple uh, in Delhi. And they also call themselves the uh, Swami Narayan Hindu mission. And in all their temples, they teach Hinduism. In the Delhi temple, they have a huge display on Hinduism. It's almost like a Disney world. They have a 10-minute boat ride down the Saraswati River. 
and all the outside of this beautiful temple, it's over 200 feet high, hand-carved marble. They have all the heads of the sampradayas of all the Hindu orders represented, even though they hold to their own sampradaya. And this is something the Hindus need to understand. You can hold to your own sampradaya and yet embrace the Sanatana Dharma as a whole. Hinduism does not require that we all look alike, dress alike, and follow the same exact set of creeds or you know, repeat the same prayer every day at the same time. That is not a sign of spirituality. That is a sign of social control and uh, domination from the outside. So it's very important that the Hindus unite. And we also need more teaching of what Hindu Dharma is. For every Hindu child, when asked these basic questions, uh, who am I, what is God, what is Dharma, what is Hinduism, why am I a Hindu, how is Hinduism different than the other religions of the world, will have an answer. And I have to tell you very clearly that all religions are not the same. You know, there are certain, there's a certain type of thinking uh, that... Uh, it's largely like consists, I would say, platitudes or superficial statements, like all human beings are the same. See, at one level, all human beings are the same, but at another level, all human beings are different. And the other thing is we need to introduce, in this same regard, Viveka discrimination back into Hinduism. This, you need more discrimination about the spiritual teachings you follow than about work, relationship, diet, any other aspect of life. You cannot say that all food is the same because its goal is nutrition. And it doesn't matter what food you eat or when you eat it, that everybody should be equally healthy and happy regardless of their dietary inclinations because food is one and we all need food. And yet that's what the Hindus do in the spiritual realm. They say all religions are the same because there's certain principles in common. That's not enough. If we look at the teachings, Hinduism is first of all a sadhana, which means individual spiritual practice. Most of the religions of the world are not sadhanas. They teach salvation by proxy, salvation through another, salvation by belief, once a belief is accepted, and in fact, there is no sadhana. That is why they have so much uh, energy for converting others, because they have no sadhana to do on themselves. <laughs> Their sadhana is to convert. That is the fact. That is how they view it. And they view it that they can save your soul. Now, how can a soul be saved? Soul is a spiritual principle. How, in fact, when the Pope came to India, he said, we look to a new harvesting of souls in the upcoming millennium in India. How can you harvest a soul? Who is going to harvest it? The soul is an inviolable spiritual principle. So Hinduism is sadhana based. And why are people attracted to all these Hindu practices outside of India? Meditation, chakras, kundalini, yoga, meditation. Excuse me for a second. Yes. A small announcement. Okay. Now, friends, there are two vehicles, Wagon R3511 and Item 0693. Both of the vehicles are obstructing the passage and the chairman of the institute, he wants to move. So we Thank you. I thought it was an announcement from on high. <laughs> <laughs> so, people want the practices. They want things to change. Now, science is becoming aware of higher states of consciousness. Where are these higher states of consciousness defined, explored? Where are the practices for them? These are coming out of India from these dharmic traditions. You're not finding them in the belief-based uh, traditions. Another movement we have today in the world is the interfaith movement. And I say we need dialogue between, and dialogue and discussion between all groups is always welcome. At the same time, a lot of the interfaith movements often represent something like the political gatherings, where heads of state comes together to get more favorable trade treaties for their own country. And so the Hindus have to be realistic 
that uh, these differences exist and the other religious groups are willing to exploit them. I want to put this idea before you. The Hindus are the group that has most promoted the unity of all religions, right? At the same time, Hinduism as a religion has the least respect of all these religions, including the religions that it claims unity with. Because in the other religions, it is a matter of exclusivity. It is not a matter of inclusivity. Again, I'm not saying you should criticize or be against somebody, but you need to understand what they are actually saying. Many Hindus accept Jesus and say Jesus was a yogi. In fact, Jesus may have very well been a yogi. The problem is the Christians don't believe that. <laughs> and as long as the Christians don't believe that, it doesn't help the Hindus to say because Jesus was a yogi, Christianity is yogic. Korean Christianity is not a yogic system. Uh, it has different values. It has its pluses. I'm not saying there's nothing of value in these systems. And there's, I'm also not saying that Hindus cannot learn something from them. But you have to know the similarities and the differences and the strengths and weaknesses. The greatest strengths of the Western religions is that they form greater cohesive social organizations to help and to protect their members. So joining them is like joining a protective community. And most people join the Western religions not because of the theology, but because of the social support. They get a good job. They get, a, their, they get access to a hospital education or in some areas they're just protected from being attacked. <laughs> now that you've joined them, you'll no longer be attacked as an outsider. But the theology is very simple. They do not have a theology of self-realization, God-realization, karma, rebirth. They have a very simplistic creedal view. And at a theological level, Hinduism is the most sophisticated of the religions, has the deepest philosophies, in fact, faith-based traditions usually do not have a philosophy. Who is the most famous philosopher in the Christian tradition is a figure called St. Thomas Aquinas. What did St. Thomas Aquinas do? He rewrote Aristotle as if Aristotle were a Christian, which, of course, he was a pagan. So essentially, their philosophy theology is pagan, but they changed the name, moved a few terms around, and then put it in their own particular system. That is why the Hindu philosophy uh, is so much in harmony with the science and with the higher views. The other factor here too relative to faith is that Hinduism is not simply a faith. In Hinduism there's an emphasis on knowledge. Even the bhakti has a tremendous jnana and very deep philosophy about it. It is not simply blind bhakti or emotion. There's also a difference between bhakti or devotion and bhakti yoga. You can have devotion, but without a yoga to cultivate it, you're not taking it anywhere. So there is devotion in many people and many traditions throughout the world, but without a yoga to cultivate it, uh, it doesn't go very far. Hinduism back to the Vedas is a vidya or a way of knowledge, a cognitive science a way of perceiving the truth, knowing oneself, knowing the nature of the universe. And in this regard, the yoga teaches us that besides the five senses and the rational mind, we have a higher intuitive ability. And that higher intuitive ability comes forth when the mind is silent, when the mind is concentrated. So the purpose of the yoga and the meditation is to silence the mind for the direct perception of truth, not simply to impose an idea upon the mind, accept a belief, accept the faith, and then impose that on the nature of reality. And this is what makes Hinduism difficult because it is many complex, it's very complex and many-sided. 
in Hinduism we have the largest literature of any religious tradition in the world, one that extends to medicine, science, philosophy, psychology. In fact, I sometimes say there are more religions inside of Hinduism than outside of it because the other religions have rejected things. Their identity is based upon rejection. We do not accept use of images. We do not accept this. We do not accept... In fact, it's interesting to note that in a lot of the religions of the world, mysticism is not accepted. And self-realization is also not accepted. You have to accept what the prophet, the messenger, the savior says. He is the way. You do not have a direct access to the truth apart from that. So you cannot just mechanically, in mass, convert people to Hinduism the way you can to certain other religions. It requires a change of a way of life, a way of thought, a way of perception, and it requires a degree of local adaptation. And that is why there is a little difference in what Hinduism is in the different parts of India and also in the different countries and places where it has gone. Because even though when you have a universal teaching, you still have to have a local adaptation. That is one of the principles of ecology to think globally, but to act locally. One of the reasons why in Hinduism there's so many different devatas, gods, goddesses, you can call them or whatever, is because there is a connection to the divine in your own local environment. There is seeing the divine presence in the mountains, the rivers, the customs, the traditions, the people around you. There is Kailas, but there is a Kailas. There's a Shiva Parvata in every place. So that makes it more complex. And because Hinduism, as we also say, is a pluralistic tradition, accepts that there are many paths. And here, too, we also have to be careful. Hinduism says that there are many paths, but it doesn't say that all paths are necessarily good, or they're all necessarily good for everybody. That there are many paths does not mean it doesn't matter which path you choose. It is just the opposite. When you have many paths, it's very important to choose the right path. Same thing in all walks of life. Today, we have a pluralistic world. You have many choices of political candidates. Unfortunately, we don't have any good choices. <laughs> the point is, the choice does matter, whether it's food, relationship, work. You have a number of choices. It doesn't mean all the choices are good. You can make a blunder. So too, many paths is a freedom which also allows us to make mistakes. You know, in that respect, we can also look at science. We cannot say all scientific theories are correct, even if the scientist himself was a good person. That he was a good person has no bearing on whether the theory he has was correct. So these paths do exist, and we need to be very discriminating. Sometimes people come to me and say to me, what religion should I follow? order to find truth. What I tell them is follow the path that takes you most directly to self-realization and union with the divine, wherever it comes from, whatever name uh, that it has. And in this regard, there are a lot of traditions who do not, that do not have uh, such paths uh, at all. And we also have to remember there's a difference between political tolerance and holding to your inner truth. You know, at a political level, we all need to accept that there are many religions in the world, that there are, you know, many countries, many people. All these things are there. It's not for one group to impose themselves politically on another. But at the same time, Hindus do not have to give up their identity or their values to be politically tolerant. But somehow there is the idea that for Hindus to be tolerant in India, they have to give up their Hindu identity because it's offensive to certain other groups. But other groups do not have to give up their religious identity in order to be politically tolerant in India. In fact, if they assert their religious identity, they are often highlighted in, as, as, as ideal political representatives of their community. In other words, you can be a very staunch Hindu in your religious life, that has no bearing on, you, you can still be very tolerant. In fact, tolerance, democracy, pluralism in the political life 
also is something that is in harmony with the basic Hindu values. Anyway, because we recognize that the divine dwells in each person and each person needs to find a path that works for them, there is no one path that can be imposed in mass upon everyone and that can work for the good of everyone. It is always a matter of individual sadhana and practice. So in India, the Hinduism is much more under siege. Outside of India, there is an expansion of Hindu practices, but there needs to be a greater Hindu consciousness. And overall, the common factor is that we need better education as to Sanatana Dharma and how things fit uh, together. Uh, for example, in the West, I'm often asked the question of where does yoga fit in uh, with uh, Hinduism. And in this regard, I noticed that East or West, we don't like to define things. We like to just follow certain stereotypes. For example, in India, in, if we look at Vedic text, yoga is a common term for practice. Veda is knowledge, yoga is its practice. In this regard, branches of yoga are jnana yoga, yoga of knowledge, bhakti yoga, yoga of devotion, hatha yoga, raj yoga, laya yoga, mantra yoga. There's so many yogas that way. If we look at yoga as a specific school, we have the yoga of the yoga sutras of Patanjali. Actually, the yoga darshana wasn't founded by Patanjali. The yoga darshana goes back to Hiranyagarbha. In the Gita Mahabharata, there's all talks of yoga, but there's no Patanjali mentioned there because he is a bit later figure and the teachings that he's bringing in are not something that he invented. But even that Yoga Sutra Yoga is Sankhya Yoga. There's also Vaishnava Yoga, there's Shaiva Yoga. There's so many related yogas. They have much in common, but they also have their various differences as well. And they're all rooted in the Sanatana Dharma. In fact, the Vedas themselves are mantra yoga. That is the whole foundation. In fact, the Vedas in their key mantras hold all the essential teachings that came out in the Sanatana Dharma later. That's a whole subject uh, in its own right. But in the course of my study of the Vedas, basically what